Well, we come now to the most difficult part of this seminar. And in, by way of preface, I want to say that to re-emphasize the point that I've made already, that in presenting ideas, I exaggerate. <clears throat> the reason for this is that, the, uh, that insofar as I present ideas, whereas the actual content of the philosophy is not ideas but experience, these ideas are intended to act as correctives. And so, when you're walking a tightrope, you learn balancing. And so, if you're in danger of falling in a certain direction, you throw the weight the other way. And uh, there are all sorts of funny tricks to balancing, as you know when you ride a bicycle. You turn the front wheel in the direction in which you're falling. Whereas the person who doesn't know how to ride a bicycle tends to turn the wheel the other way. So he falls over. So in, in, in this kind of way, what I'm talking about is always a corrective to whatever is a dominant current idea. At the end of that famous classic of Zen Buddhism called the Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch, or the Tan Jing, the Platform Sutra, uh, in a chapter that people have virtually neglected, Huineng explains the whole technique of Zen teaching by saying, if somebody asks you a question about metaphysical things, you answer in terms of everyday life. If somebody asks you a question about everyday life, you answer in terms of metaphysical. For example, what is the ultimate meaning of Buddhism? Master replies, the cypress tree in the yard. Second example. Uh, master and student are working together in the fields, and the student says, please pass me the knife. The master hands him the knife blade first, holding the entire handle in his hand. The student says, please give me the other end. The master says, what would you do with the other end? In the first case, the metaphysical is answered in terms of the everyday. In the second case, the everyday is answered in terms of the metaphysical. And this is balancing. This is the whole meaning of the uh, when Buddhism is called the middle way. The middle way doesn't mean the compromise. It means balancing out. Uh, the Upanishads refer to this as the path of the razor's edge. So, in this way, if I use an idea at all, it is for the sake of counteracting an idea that is current. For example, uh, Buddhists will explain that when the Buddha taught what are called the three signs of being, three signs of being are anicca, that all things are transient, um, anatman, that there is no self, and uh, dukkha, that everything is frustration and suffering. He did this not to say, that's the way it is, really. Now, finally, this is the dogma. This is my doctrine. He did it to counteract the idea that reality is eternal. He says it's flux. To counteract the idea that there uh, is a self that is the permanent witness of the transient panorama of experience, he teaches no self. And to counteract the idea that the aim of life is happiness, he teaches the fact of life is misery. Buddhism is a dialogue. It is not a doctrine. This is terribly important. There are no such things as the doctrines of Buddhism. There is simply a dialogue between a teacher and a student. And the student creates the teacher by raising the problem. And so there is the back and forth in which 
If the student tries to fix on this point of view, the teacher emphasizes that. And then when the student says to the teacher, well, all right, I'm going to agree with you. Whoops, you've nothing to stand on. He goes over here, or over here, or over here, or over here. So that in the end of the dialogue, you get to a position where you found that all opinions, all views, or drishti, are inadequate. Because every view of Mount Tamalpais is different. And so there is no, say, correct way of seeing Mount Tamalpais. There was once a wonderful Zen master called Ikkyu. And uh, he lived in Kyoto. And in front of his temple, there was a very nubbly, gnarled pine tree. And one day he posted a notice by this pine tree which said, I will give 100 yen, which was quite a sum in those days, to anybody who can see this tree straight. So soon there were all kinds of people standing around the tree, lying on the ground, trying to climb up on the wall above it and find an angle from which the central trunk of the tree could be seen as a straight line. There was one fellow who knew there was some monkey business going on, as there would be with a Zen master poses a problem. And so he went to a friend of Ikkyu's who was a priest of another sect, but Ikkyu was very friendly with this priest. And uh, this priest was called, uh, what was his name? Something like Ryoman. And... Uh, Ryoman said, the simple way to see the tree straight is, of course, to look straight at it. And so the man went back to Ikkyu and said, I have solved the problem of the tree. He said, to see it straight, you look straight at it. And Ikkyu looked at him very suspiciously because he, he wasn't convinced that this man was a real understanding man. But he nevertheless, he forked out the hundred yen and said, you must have been talking to Ryoman. <laughs> so, now, let's, against, as a corrective, you see, to our own fascination with time and our own obsession with the future, pose the counter-idea that there is no future at all. That everything we call the future is a complete mirage. So is the past. There is no future, there is no past, there is only this now. And you say, well, that's ridiculous. Because so far as the past is concerned, we are quite sure of it. We know we've got every kind of historical record. We've got our own experience to prove that uh, uh, my mother, who is not alive now, really did exist at one time, that Socrates, that Jesus, that uh, Alexander the Great, all these people really did exist, and there was a past that led up to now. It's all in the history books. It's been photographed. It's been recorded. And obviously it's real. And if that's real, then it's perfectly clear that this process we're involved in is going to go on and there is going to be a future. This is such elementary common sense. But I want to challenge it radically. And we will take as our beginning the act of throwing a pebble into a pool. And you will see concentric circles of waves created. And you see these actual waves flowing out across the pool. Now, the truth of the matter is that they don't. That water goes up and down, but no wave travels. You get the same illusion when you see a rotating barber pole or a rotating screw. The thing is revolving, and it looks as if something is traveling upwards along, but the the, the successive red stripes of the barber's pole are moving up, but they are not moving up. Now, there's the basic principle. This is the basic principle of the world considered as maya or illusion. So then you might say, reasoning from this, that 
there is something going on that is history, that uh, there was Socrates and there was uh, all these great figures and great movements and wars and uh, all these political uh, shenanigans that we call history. But they are all what we're doing now with simply the names changed. It goes on and on. I like to tell a story of a, which is a German story and it has German humor. There was a fisherman sitting on the banks of a river and uh, somebody came up and was watching him and said, it seems to me that you're doing something very cruel, putting those worms on hooks and using them as bait. He said, but they are used to it. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> what is going on is a constant repetition of the same thing, but appearing to be different all the time. Every, uh, the French proverb, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more it changes, the more it's the same thing. So that always we get the idea that every situation is completely new. New participants, new personalities, new children involved. And yet, it's the same old process going on. Or uh, you get a similar thing. And this comes out of LSD experiences. If you look at a Rorschach blot under the influence of LSD, you have the very odd sensation that you are watching the watery ink flowing into position. It's still moving, as when you know you make the ink blot and then you fold the paper across. So underneath your fold, all the ink goes blah, up like this and finally fixes in a certain position. But you open it and with LSD, you can see it's still happening. It is moving, but it's still. And this connects very, very importantly with the um, Zen philosophy of the nature of time. And I want to read you some quotations from uh, Dogen, who uh, was a great founder of the Soto Zen school, who wrote a book called Shobo Genzo, which has never been fully translated. We only have excerpts from it. And it's a funny thing, because I was talking about this book with a wonderful Zen master, who I think is really a magnificent person, called Morimoto. And uh, I had Gary Snyder as an interpreter, and he's, an, as he's a magnificent interpreter because he has a wonderful command of Japanese and an equally good understanding of Zen. And so I, the impression of the conversation that I, remains in my memory is that I had a direct talk with Morimoto, and the interpreter eliminated himself. It was very strange. So we, we brought up the Shobo Genzo, and he said, Ah, oh, he said, that's a terrible book. He said, it explains everything. It makes it all completely intelligible. <laughs> and we were discussing its translation, and we were discussing the translation of Zen texts in general. And he went on to say, you don't need to translate any Zen texts into English. Not if you really want to understand Zen. He said, you use your own books. Use the dictionary. Use Alice in Wonderland. Use the Bible. Use anything. He said, that. you realize, don't you, he said, the sound of the rain needs no translation. And a few days afterwards, I went with Gary to the uh, morning lecture given by the master of Daitokuji. And he was explaining a Chinese text. And in the middle of his explanation, a tremendous rainstorm occurred. And the thunder of the rain on the roof was drowned out absolutely anything he had to say. But he didn't stop. He went straight on with the lecture. Because there was the sound of the rain. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> whatever was going on was it. 
And those the funny lectures they have, called Taisho, where the teacher sits opposite the Buddha. See, he, he sits on this side of the room, Buddha sits over there, and then the monks sit on this side and the visitors sit on that side. It's a long rectangular room, and he carries on this dialogue with the Buddha. And everybody's invited to listen. Well, you know it. It's a very funny thing. It doesn't make any sense. So, this Shobo Genzo, Dogen has a lot to say in it about um, the nature of time and the nature of change. And the basic thought here is this, and I'm going to try and show you how the same experience can be conveyed by using language expressions that are formally contradictory. He says, for example, that the spring does not become the summer. And uh, when wood is burned, the wood does not become the ashes. He says there is spring and then there is summer. There is wood, and then there is ashes. And so, by inference, you now, who are sitting here with me and talking, you will ne never die, just as the wood will never become the ashes. T.S. Eliot plays the same idea in the Four Quartets poems when he's describing uh, the passengers who boarded the train are not the same people who will arrive at the destination. You sitting here are not the same people who walked in at the door. You have changed. And so you're not the same. So this is as if to say, time is created by the illusion that this state and this state and this state and this state are in some way connected. Now, you would say, well, that is a kind of atomism. That is uh, saying that there is, um, that life is a mo like a movie. That movie is a series of frames on film, which by being spun through the camera, create the illusion that it's not a series of frames, but it's a single frame moving. Now, this is one way of saying exactly the same thing as could be said in the other way, and the other way of saying it is this. The notion that the movement of life is simply a succession of static states is a purely intellectual way of breaking things down. It's like calculus. It's like saying that a curve is a series of point instants. That when you hear a continuous sound, if you analyze it, it's a ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-
But the, the point of, of, of saying that, that you driving down the highway is one thing, and you sitting in this room is something altogether different. The point of saying that <coughs> is simply as a gimmick or what is called in Sanskrit an upaya or skillful means for getting people to realize what it is to be here and now. And to see that this is what's important. Whenever you get into the meditative state, by whatever means you get in, you suddenly understand that the whole point of life is what you're doing, where you are. And this results in a kind of uh, untightening of all your muscles. And you suddenly see that it really is worth looking around. That the chips of wood on the log, the funny markings on the concrete, the expressions and gestures of people sitting around are what it's all about. And uh, there is no difference between the ecstatic state of union with Brahman or Nirvana and the very matter-of-fact moment in which we are sitting around here in various postures, feeling various feelings throughout our bodies, thinking various thoughts, and uh, just because you have consented to do so, allowing the noises that I'm making to reverberate across your eardrums. This yang that's going on is uh, the yang 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 that everything is, you see. That's what it is. That's what it's about. <clears throat> and you sit back and you say, yeah, that's what it's about. Listen to that, man. That Get that yang yang yang. <laughs> Isn't that marvelous, you know, that it does that at all? <laughs> and that is called, in, in Buddhism, seeing things in their suchness. Tathata means suchness. Tathata is da-da-da. Da-da-da, 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 you see? Seeing everything as uh, just that. This person goes this way, the other person goes that way. You have this style, I have that style. And uh, so, in the scenery of spring, there is nothing superior, nothing inferior. Flowering branches grow naturally, some short, some long. But, however, it is an extraordinary experience to overcome the illusion that there really is time. Well, let's begin this way. It isn't, isn't it obvious, uh, bearing in mind the point that I made this morning about our present not being a hairline, but a kind of fuzzy span, uh, which polarizes past at one end and future at the other. These are simply the two ends of the present as we perceive it directly. But beyond that, beyond what we perceive directly, beyond what you see now, hear now, feel now, where is the past? What has happened to the pop of a champagne cork which you heard last night? Well, it just isn't there. And where is tomorrow's edition of the San Francisco Chronicle? It hasn't yet come off the press. It isn't there. So from a sensory, material, realistic point of view, there is no past, and there simply is no future. Never was, never will be. <clears throat> Your conception of the past is very subjective. You've only to study history 
to realize how subjective it is, how many ways history can be written. Because every historian, what does he deal with? He deals with records and with memories which are extremely fragmentary because he deals with mostly with verbal records and sometimes archaeological records of the past. And not only are these records fragmentary, that they only record those aspects of what happened that were worthy of note to someone or other who recorded them, but then when he in turn gets the notes, he uses them like a Rorschach blot, and he projects onto them his idea of what happened. Anybody who has a lot of experience of courts of law knows, for example, in cross-examining witnesses that their testimony as to what did happen is extremely arbitrary and confused. We are making sense all the time of this Rorschach blood. So the, his the history is much more an art than a science. It is a reconstruction by a historian who uses the materials of evidence in the same way that a painter uses paints. And in this way, he reconstructs his version of the past, and if he's sufficiently persuasive, he convinces other people that that's what happened. Uh, various uh, sneaky governments have caught on to this and realized that they can write their own official history about anything. And then they've got a doctrine that there is a kind of historical destiny, a historical compulsion that certain things as a result of history must happen. And then they use this to justify what they're going to do anyhow. Nowhere is this more apparent in scholarship than in historical studies of the four Gospels and the life of Jesus. If you study all the great scholars, say, from 1850 to the present day, who have examined the New Testament from a historical point of view, you will find that every one of them has a different history. And that they have seen the texts from the point of view of their own particular way of uh, wanting to present Jesus. They've got excellent reasons for rejecting all those parts of the text that don't agree with their interpretation and accepting those that do. And they cancel each other out the whole way down the line. So we know then, uh, from a sensory point of view, that just as you cannot point to the difference between your fingers, you cannot find the past. Equally, you cannot find any future. It isn't here. And the future, as such, never will be here. As the proverb says, tomorrow never comes. So then you have a situation which is eternal. From the beginning of any form of existence whatsoever, whether it was mineral or merely gaseous, whether it was a, an amoeba, whether it was a plant, an animal, a human being. It knew that it was involved in a process, or it was involved in a process, even if it didn't know, where the individual form begins and ends. Or does it? Where do you draw the line? Let's say we have a vibrating curve like this. Yes, you can point to a tangent. You can draw tangents along the top of all the curves and along the bottom of all the curves. And where those tangents touch the wave, you say, this is the crest, this is the trough. The crest is where it is most there. The trough is where it is not there. But you see it once that you can't have the wave if you don't have both the crest and the trough. And that every time it goes crest-trough, well, that's a wave. But what is a wave?
Didn't we see in the image of throwing the stone into the pool that there is no A wave? There is waving, but there is really no individual wave. You think you see this individual wave going out like that. Take a piece of cloth, spread it out on a table, and then push it together so that you get a fold across the center. See? All right, now, move your hands so that you make that folding happen all the way across the cloth. The cloth doesn't move. The fold moves. The folding moves. But is this a folding? Can you pin it down and say it's an entity? You can't. So in exactly the same way, all our human history, from our earliest possible imaginable ancestors until now, is standing still in the same place, doing the same thing, over and over again, but coming on each time in such a way as to give us the notion that it's new. You are your fathers and grandfathers millions of years ago. You say they were sitting around in skins and using stone implements. From the point of view of somebody a million years hence, we are sitting around in skins using stone implements. The past people always were. But you see, when those people were sitting around in caves with stone implements and skins, they had ways of conversing and relating to each other, which contained as much qualitative subtlety as we do, as we have. Uh, what we call primitive people, have perceptions, ways of doing things that we uh, would not even know, we wouldn't even know what to look for. And so they have, in fact, a very, very high culture. Only it's based, it's, it's, it's structured, say, in a different dimension, on a different wavelength than ours. But it is just as human and just as authentic. But we, we have the illusion, you see, that it keeps changing, getting better, getting worse, one thing or another. But that's the same kind of illusion as the motion, apparent motion of the wave across the pool. So uh, let's see how Dogen puts it, because um, he's got some vivid ideas. If we watch the shore while we are sailing a boat, we feel that the shore is moving. But if we look nearer to the boat itself, we know then that it is the boat which moves. When we regard the universe in confusion of body and mind, we often get the mistaken belief that our mind is constant. But if we actually practice Zen and come back to ourselves, we see that this was wrong. When firewood becomes ashes, it never returns to being firewood. But we should not take the view that what is latterly ashes was formerly firewood. What we should understand is that according to the doctrine of Buddhism, firewood stays at the position of firewood. And then ashes are at the position of ashes. There are former and later stages, but these stages are clearly cut. It is the same with life and death. Thus we say in Buddhism that the unborn is also the undying. Life is a position of time. Death is a position of time. They are like winter and spring. And in Buddhism, we do not consider that winter becomes spring or that spring becomes summer. 
Now another quote. When a fish swims, he swims on and on, and there is no end to the water. When a bird flies, he flies on and on, and there is no end to the sky. From the most ancient times, there was never a fish who swam out of the water, nor a bird who flew out of the sky. Yet when the fish needs just a little water, he uses just a little, and when he needs lots, he uses lots. Th thus, <coughs> <coughs> thus the tips of their heads are always at the outer edge of their space. If ever a bird flies beyond that edge, he dies, and so also the fish. From the water the fish makes his life, and from the sky the bird makes his. But this life is made by the bird and the fish. At the same time, the bird and the fish are made by life. Thus there are the fish, the water, and life, and all three create each other. Yet, if there were a bird who first wanted to examine the size of the sky, or a fish who first wanted to examine the extent of the water and then try to fly or to swim, they will never find their own ways in the sky or water. So what he is saying now, look, space is as far as you can see. The farther you can see, of course, the more space there is. So with time. The element of time is as much time as you can know. But this, I mean here, direct knowledge. Your perce perception of time, which you call the present. To be concerned with the future, you see, would it be like the fish who gets out of water. He would die. So, to, to put it in another way, what you call time is not something into which you have been dropped, as if somebody had dropped you onto a, uh, an escalator and you suddenly found yourself carried by it. What you call the experience of time is you. It's not some, something else altogether, you see, in, in, which, which is a trap for you. You are time. All right, you go on, you want to go on? Okay, you create time by wanting to go on. Why do you want to go on? Well, you say, because... Uh, well, one must go on. Why? Why must you go on? Do you feel compelled? Yeah? It's our duty to go on. How did you learn that idea? Well, we were taught it when we were children by our parents. They said, you must survive. You must live. And they were taught that by their parents. And so they knew no better. But if you live a life in which you feel you must survive, then your life is a drag. And you go on and feel you must go on because you are not fulfilled now. If you really understood the now, you would not feel that you had to go on. As Confucius even put it, a man who understands the Tao in the morning can die content in the evening. But if you feel, you see, I must go on, I must go on, it is because you have not lived. You're always hoping to live. So then, if you come to your senses, which will tell you there isn't anything but the now, and that therefore, because there isn't anything but the now, it is supremely important to 
rest in it, to get with it, to be one with it, you will understand uh, the point, what's going on. That you, in your way, are your fathers and your grandfathers come back. Myriads and myriads of past events are still going on in you and you are doing the same thing, only it keeps looking different. In the same illusory way that the wave appears to be moving across the surface of the water.